The scripture reading before the lesson will come from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Again, that's Philippians 2, 5 through 8. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Perhaps every marriage has a period known as the honeymoon phase where everything is flawless and everything is wonderful and that person you're married to can do nothing wrong at all. They even smell good all the time. And then reality sets in. Tempers flare. Words cut. Hateful, spiteful conduct begins to happen on a regular basis. The six-pack grew into a full case. The thick, dark hair turned loose or turned white. The smooth, silky, shaved legs morphed into a cactus plant underneath those sheets, didn't they? <laughs> Who is this person? What happened? And why so soon? The reality is the honeymoon is over. Perhaps the honeymoon phase lasts a little longer for some than others, but within a period of a few months to perhaps a few years, things will change in almost every marriage. Children change things. I didn't say for the worst, but they change things. Age changes things. Injuries change things. Work changes things. But we must remain committed to our spouse for the long haul. Most of us said, what? For better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health till death. Do us part. Are we willing today, right now, to make the necessary changes, number one, to please God, but number two, to please our spouse? Today's sermon is entitled, The Honeymoon is Over. Five things we want to do this morning. Here's the first one. Instead of talking about the honeymoon coming to an end, we're going to talk really about successful, lasting marriages. Five things with regard to successful, lasting marriages. Number one, Successful, lasting marriages require transformation. Transformation. Marriage is for the mature. Serious problems are bound to occur in every marriage where spiritual, scriptural maturity is either absent or lacking. One of the first lessons which must be learned and implemented in order to have a successful marriage is the denial of self. Chasing a ball at all hours of the day and night is not quite as appealing to some as it is others, is it? Men, perhaps we need to put the ball on the shelf. Is it all about us or is it all about our spouse? Sitting at the in-law's house all day is not everyone's cup of tea. Your parents might be great to you. They might not be that way to me. Have you thought about that? What's the point? Both parties in the marriage must learn to compromise, which requires a mature mindset. Go with me to the book of Colossians. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 are some of the most practical chapters of the entire Bible. Meaning what? Open them up, read them, and go do what that says. You don't really need a whole lot of background. Open the Bible, read that, go do that, and you'll be fine. Let's begin in Colossians 3 and verse 8 and observe these phrases. Watch the put off and watch the put on, okay? Put off, put on. 
But now, Colossians 3, 8, ye also put off. You see it? Put off all these. Number one, anger. Number two, wrath. Number three, malice. Number four, blasphemy. Number five, filthy communication out of whose mouth? Out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have, there it is again, put off. What have we put off? In this instance, it's the old man. It's like a, a, an old person, isn't it? Seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. Now look carefully at verse 10 and have put on. If you go home today, you're probably going to put off your church clothes, aren't you? But before you turn around and go back outside that door, you better put something on. Have you thought about that? Putting off something is one thing, but before we get out in front of people, uh, perhaps we should put on some more clothes, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't that be wise? With regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are some things that have to be put off. I think we understand that. But have we put on what God requires us to put on? Especially with regard to our spouses. Look at this. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where, verse 11, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now look at verse 12. Put on. Put some things off, but put on some things. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Question. Do bowels of mercies count in the marriage bond? Or is that only with your brethren? Bowels of mercies. Kindness. Same question. Does that count in marriage or is that just to people at the building? What is this? Where does this apply? That's not all, is it? Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as to this degree. Even as what? Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Question, does that have any application to the marriage bond? There has to be a transformation that takes place in order to have a successful, lasting marriage, isn't there? Look at verse number 14, and above all these things. Well, you say, wow, put these things off is important, put these things on is important, but there's something that takes precedence. It would seem, doesn't it? And above all these things put on charity, that is love, which is the bond, it is the glue of perfectness, completion. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So says Romans 12, 1 and 2. Number two, successful, lasting marriages require, in the second place, responsibility. Responsibility. How many people know what the Bible teaches about the various responsibilities associated with marriages? Perhaps none other than the Godhead only knows for certain. How many marriages are in serious distress due to a lack of knowledge and implementation of biblical teaching? Every single problem in marriage comes from either a lack of biblical knowledge or a lack of biblical implementation. Either we don't know what the Bible teaches and therefore cannot implement it, or we know what the Bible teaches and for whatever reason have yet to implement it to our lives. One of two things every time. Husbands have a responsibility to know and implement what God expects of them as husbands. True or false? Wives have a responsibility to know and implement what God expects of them as wives. True or false? Brethren, are we reading... As we ought to read. John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. John 8, 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know what? Ye shall know what? The truth, and the truth shall make you free. What about Ephesians 3, 3 to 5? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye, ye may understand, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Are we reading the Bible like we read our Google feed? Just kind of glance at it, get to key words here and there, and then just move on? Or are we reading the Bible like we look into the mirror and say, well, what's wrong with my face? Don't answer that. What's wrong with my face? Let me do what I can do to correct my face. I don't look, I don't look right. Something's wrong. I need to fix that so I can be presentable to people. Is that how we read the Bible? Do we read it with the intent of saying, what does this say and how can I apply it to me? Or do we read it like a Google feed, just kind of skip through it and say, yeah, I got it. I, I pulled my time. I looked at the Bible today. Number three, successful, lasting marriages require understanding. Understanding. The word understanding really brings an interesting concept that is often misunderstood. Let's go to the book of wisdom. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs. Let's start in the very first chapter in the very first verse of Proverbs. Let's read Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, and let's just see where this word understanding or understand, and let's, let's look at some of the other words as it is used in this context. Proverbs 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive, to grasp, to discern what? The words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. Verse 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of what? Understanding shall attain unto what type of counsel? Wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Perhaps you could summarize the book of Proverbs by verse number 7. The fear of the Lord, the fear, the reverential awe of Jehovah. And if you don't have all toward Jehovah, maybe you ought to be terrified. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. It is square peg number one is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Understanding means to grasp the meaning by settling, or by setting rather, the factual evidence in place, then drawing correct conclusions. Understanding occurs when the facts are discerned, comprehended, and applied in harmony with God's word. Question. Have we made an attempt to understand our spouse? Have we made the best attempt possible to consider things from their point of view? Or have we closed our minds to their perspective? We don't care what they think. We don't care anybody else's perspective but our own. Many times that's precisely what we've done. And the sad reality is that's not the full extent of our closed-mindedness. Most of the time we've closed our minds to God's word. You know why many times we don't understand? We're not trying. We don't put forth any effort. I read somewhere, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That does not read like a suggestion. That reads like a command. And that's located in Ephesians 5.17. Or just two chapters earlier, he said, whereby when you read, you may understand. Why don't we understand? Perhaps we're not reading. Why don't we understand our spouse? Perhaps we're not communicating with them. You know, there's different ways of listening. You know how a lot of people listen? They wait to talk. They've already made up in their minds what they're going to say. They're not listening to anything. you They're not concerned about your perspective. They're waiting on you to finish talking so they can respond with what they've already made up in their minds. Is that how God's people are? Number four. Successful, lasting marriages require transparency. Transparency. You know, it's amazing to think that in this information age in which we live, some individuals are still attempting to hide aspects of their lives 
from their spouse. On the one hand, even if we dupe our spouse, guess what? Have we duped God? Even if we dupe our spouse, have we duped God? Let's let the Bible answer that. Let's go to Hebrews 4. Let's see what Hebrews 4 verses 12 and 13 has to say about that. Hebrews 4 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. It is living. It is active. It's not a dead letter. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now look at verse 13. Perhaps most of us are familiar with verse 12. Are we familiar with verse 13? The very next verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. What does that mean? But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Even if we dupe our spouse, have we duped God? No. Wise course of advice is transparency. Try and hide it. Be transparent. Now, once we consider things from the perspective on this hand that we cannot do God, we still have one more hand, don't we? Have we considered Romans 12, 17 to 21 from the perspective of our marriages? Have we considered Romans 12, verses 17 through 21 from the perspective of our marriages? Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of who? All men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men dearly. Beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What's the point? Verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Do we apply that to our marriage? If, have you thought about that? If that's how we're, we as members of the Lord's church, as Christians, if that's how we're supposed to treat our enemies, feed them, give them drink, how in the world are we supposed to treat our spouse? Do we treat our enemies better than we treat our spouse? I can think of two words in the King James Bible to answer that question. What are they? God forbid. May it never be. May it never be said of us. Are we being transparent with our spouses? Because in order to have successful, lasting marriages, there's going to have to be some transparency. And if nothing else encourages us to be transparent, God knows anyway. Not fooling the Godhead at all. Number five. Successful, lasting marriages require hope. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward mankind, appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed forth abundantly upon us through Jesus Christ that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3, 4 through 7 is one of the most beautiful passages of scripture in the entire Bible. Did you, did you catch some of those important words? Because some of the most important concepts known to humanity are found in Titus 3, 4 through 7. Kindness, love, mercy, salvation, justification, grace, and hope. Now what's the point? Here's the point. Stop trying to change them. Stop trying to change them. Everyone needs to work on changing and molding self into the glorious image of Jesus Christ, which begins with our scripture reading for this lesson. You remember what it was? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Have we thought about that? With regard to our marriages, let this mind be, what mind? The mind of Jesus Christ, 
who would leave the glories of heaven behind, tabernacle in flesh, and die a horrible, painful death. Would we do that? Can we, can we wrap our minds around that mindset? I wonder. We should never do anything to shame our spouse, and we should never do anything to shame Jesus Christ. And what's the point? Don't give up on yourself. There are times when we're going to struggle. Welcome to humanity. And certainly don't give up on your spouse. Are they human? And there are times where they're going to struggle too. You know what hope is? Hope is confident expectation. It is that which is desired and that which is expected. Focus on becoming what God desires you to be. I don't know if you can tell, but we spelled a word this morning. If you take transformation, responsibility, understanding, transparency, and hope, take all the first letters, what do you have? You want to tell you, here's the fact. Successful, lasting marriages are built upon truth. I read somewhere, and I believe you have too, where our Lord defined what truth is. Do you remember what? John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Successful, lasting marriages, therefore, are built on truth. Newsflash. Honeymoon is over. It's time to root down into the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and grow. Outward appearances will change over time. True or false? It's time right now to change the inner person into the glorious image of Jesus Christ. How does that occur? Hear the gospel, Acts 18.8. Believe the gospel, Acts 16.31. Repent of sin, Acts 17.30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Acts 8.37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Be thou faithful unto death. Remain faithful unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happens when we sin as Christians? Acts 8.22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray thou. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. We're here because we love you. Come now. As together we stand and as we sing a song of encouragement.